right, folks, it's time to move on to what you've probably all been waiting for, statistical analysis in R. Now, R provides a huge variety of options to conduct a wide variety of statistical tests, but remember, the focus of this class is on the R component of doing statistics. It is between you and your advisor and your committee to determine which specific statistical tests are most appropriate for your data, but here we're going to cover how we do some basic statistical analyses using base functions in R, and we'll go over how to interpret the results of objects created by those functions so that you can get the answers that you need out of your statistical analyses. Now this lesson is broken into two parts. In the first chunk here we're going to discuss how we make comparisons statistically between a continuous response variable and categorical predictor variables. We'll start with the t-test and then we'll discuss ANOVA first with a factor that has two levels and then a factor that has three levels. In the next section we'll get into linear regression which is the comparison of a uh, continuous variable against another continuous variable or a continuous variable and additional categorical variables. Let's begin by loading the tidyverse package. And then we'll perform some modifications of the MTCARS data set. Note here we're going to convert cylinder and the column for transmissions to a factor and or reorder the levels of that factor. As we go forward, R is going to, by default, refer to this variable and the levels therein in alphabetical order, starting with automatic and then manual. But we are actually going to turn them around now so that we can have manual be treated first. So again, you should go to a statistics class or at least a statistics manual to get an idea of what's really being done in a frequentist sort of test but really what we're going to start with is a null hypothesis, which in this case is that there is no difference between the fuel economy of cars with automatic and manual transmissions. Now, before we proceed with the statistical test, we want to formulate a alternative hypothesis before we go into it. It's always a good idea to have an idea of what you're going to expect before you conduct statistical tests. We don't just start plotting variables against each other and seeing what p-values come out at the end. Now there's two ways to approach the alternative hypothesis. One is what I would call kind of a lame alternative hypothesis is where we just say the fuel economy between automatic transmission vehicles and manual transmission vehicles are different. This is literally the opposite of the null hypothesis, which states that there is no difference in the means. We could just speculate or hypothesize that the means are different. However, a more robust hypothesis would give a specific direction for which group will have a greater fuel economy than the other. This is much more mechanistic in that it's able to connect our results to the reasons why we might observe that pattern. If we were just speculating that one is going to be different than the other, we're doing that without really any justification as to why we expect that, which seems kind of like we're just fishing with our data. But the trope for cars is that the automatic transmission gets less gas mileage because the engine has to take over the work of shifting the gears, and uh, especially with automobiles from the 1970s, there are fewer gears in an automatic transmission box. So with the manual transmissions, not only is the driver taking up the workload of shifting the gears, but there's probably more gears in the transmission so that we're always able to stay on the peak of the power curve as the driver accelerates and, and drives around. So that's the mechanism that we want to test. And we're going to formulate a more robust alternate hypothesis that manual transmissions vehicles on average get better fuel economy than automobiles with automatic transmissions. We'll first look at box plots of our data. The box plot lends evidence to the hypothesis that automatic transmission vehicles get lower gas mileage than vehicles with manual transmissions because the 
central 50% of the data for each group do not overlap. However, there are some data points that overlap on the tails of these two distributions, so it merits a statistical test to see whether this difference is really statistically significant. Prior to conducting a statistical analysis, however, we want to check the distribution of our response variable miles per gallon. We see relatively poor alignment between the graph created by geom density and the solid dark blue line generated by stat function showing the theoretical normal distribution. We'll create a tibble to compare the ratio of the means to the median. We would like this ratio to be as close to 1 as possible. The fact that it rounds to 1.05 means that it merits looking at the data after they've been logged transformed. This second tibble will do that. And we can see here that the mean and the median are much closer together and rounds to a ratio of 1. Therefore, we will proceed with log transformed data. We will use the mutate function to create a new column LMPG, which will be the log of the MPG column in empty cars. Now we can look at that distribution again. The peaks of these graphs produced by geom density and stat function overlap much more closely. Again, like I keep saying, you really need to go into the stats literature or textbooks or class or whatever to understand the nuts and bolts behind statistical analyses, but we're here going to briefly look over what is actually being compared in terms of the response and the variance or the error associated with the responses that we're measuring so that we can better interpret ours output and see where the different test statistics come in terms of the underlying theories of these three different statistical tests t-tests as we apply in a pairwise comparison, t-test as it's applied in a linear regression, and then the f-test as we get with the ANOVA table. Take a minute to review what we're actually doing when we run statistics. We're comparing a signal to the noise in our data to see if the patterns we observe are actually meaningful given all the random variance that's hanging out on there. We have three statistical comparisons to focus on, starting with the t-test which is that it compares the difference in sample means to the variance that's in the total sample. We'll also use linear regression, which is comparing an estimate of the slope of the line against the error around that estimated slope. Finally, there's an f-test, which is comparing the error that's explained by a given variable in a model against the error that's left unexplained by that model. We often refer to that as the residual error. The t-test asks whether there's actually a statistically significant difference between two means of our sample data. We can imagine having one mean and another, say of groups A and B, we've calculated from our sample. This difference there can be arithmetically expressed simply as the difference between the mean of A minus the mean of B. However, since these are sample data, there's a certain amount of error associated with each of these. In the t-test, we pretty much just summarize both of those errors, refer to that as the pooled error, and then we set it as the denominator against the difference of the means. There's a correction in there for the sample size and this ratio gives us our t-statistic. To arrive at a p-value, we look at the t-distribution. We find a value of t along its distribution, and when we're looking for things on the tails of that, we'd say that is a p of 0 0.05, and anything beyond that is going to be less than 0.05 such as 0 0.01. These are threshold values of the t-statistics. Now what's important about the t-statistic is that this is a two-sided value and so we can have negative values that depend on whether the mean was higher or lower. This provides a lot of information into the pattern. 
Linear regression asks if the change in one variable is related to change in another variable, such as the predictor variable. Let's start this with three scenarios where there is actually no significant relationship. We can think about a case in which x increases, but there's no concordant change in y. Alternatively, we can have a case where there is no change in x, but there's all sorts of change in y. We wouldn't say that these two are related. And thirdly, we can have this scattershot or cloud of data in which the values of x and y are totally independent of one another. But consider if we have this sort of relationship, whereas x increases in value, we generally have an increase in y as well. We can already kind of see that we can put a line through that data cloud. When we think about the equation for a li line, it's just y equals mx plus b. Statistically, we would express that as y is the two regression coefficients, beta 1 and beta 0. Beta 1 and m stand for the same thing. This is the slope, which is defined as rise over run, and in graph speak would be defined as the change in y over the change in x. So basically, as x increases a given unit, do we have some predictable amount of change in y as well? However, this is a statistical relationship. There is some probability associated with this. Y just sort of depends on the, these two variables, but also this associated error. We have this error term in there. This is the error that's associated with the slope estimate. So what linear regression is doing as a statistical model is comparing that slope parameter as a ratio to the estimate that's around that error. This produces a t statistic as well, and then we would take this back to the t distribution to get a p-value that is going to be based on whether this is a negative or a positive relationship. F-tests, however, compare the variance that's explained by a model term against the unexplained variance, or what we've called before the residual variance. This produces an F statistic. We can go back to our scatter plot of data. We can think about the total variance that's in that whole data cloud. And remember, we can find a bit of a line in there. And then we can go and actually find the error from that line to each observation. This is the error that's attributable to our model. Because about half of it is above the line and half of it is below the line or negative, we square that so that it doesn't come out in the wash to be zero. And then we go and take the sum of all of those squared errors. And that's the total amount of error that's explained by the model. Recall that there's this total variance in there, and so we will subtract out the sum squared error that we just found after squaring that total variance, and that results in our residual squared error. We can go back to our ratio and just divide the residual squared error out from the sum squared model error and produce our F statistic. Because this is simply a ratio, the F statistic is one-sided. So regardless of whether the slope of the line went up or down, we will always have a positive F value. We don't get insight into whether the relationship was negative or positive. Before we move on, let's talk about how ANOVA is really just linear regression. Recall in linear regression, we had this scatter plot and we were able to use this equation to compare the slope estimate to the error around that estimate. Now let's say instead of a scatter plot, we had just two groups of data. Let's call them A and B. For each of those groups, we can calculate a mean, and there would also be associated error around the mean for those two sample moments. Now we see something that looks like what we were testing in the t-test where we look at the difference between the means, but instead we can use that same line and look at the slope change between those two, and then just use that same model for a linear regression 
in this case, we still have the change in slope over the estimate error. It's just that the estimate error comes from the variance there and the beta is really just the means difference between the two observations. And that produces for us again, a T statistic from a categorical comparison. basic statistical test that we do here is the t-test in which we compare two group means. We'll try to determine whether those means are different based on the variation within the groups. This is a pairwise test. You can only apply the t-test to two group means. We can create a table of moment and distribution parameters in which we see the mean, standard deviation, and count for groups in both the manual and automatic transmission types. To get an insight into the comparisons being made by some statistical tests, we can look at the distribution of the log MPG column by the transmission types. Our statistical tests then will essentially be trying to determine whether this difference in mean miles per gallon across manual and automatic transmission types is significantly different relative to the amount of variability within each transmission type. It is simple to calculate a t-statistic by hand. We simply assign the values for both group means the standard deviation for both group means, and the sample sizes for both group means, which we calculated in the table above. This line has been programmed to arithmetically calculate a Welch's T statistic, which we can view here and interpret this 3.8 as the average miles per gallon greater that we get with a manual transmission versus an automatic transmission. To test the significance of the T statistic, we can use the T test function to get a P value off of the T distribution. Let's take a moment to dissect the output from the T test function. The first thing that we see at the bottom is that we have the estimated mean in the manual transmission group and the mean of the automatic transmission group. We see as we hypothesize that the manual transmission group is greater than automatic. Here we have our alternative hypothesis stated, which can, says that the difference in the means is not equal to zero. This is being tested against the null hypothesis that the difference in the means is in fact zero. When we compare our 3.16 to the 2.8, we get a T value, which we've computed already, as 3.8257. And the T test gives us this P value that is defined to a very large number of significant difference, it's certainly below 0.05 and we would say that P is less than 0 0.001. The last thing to call attention to is this 95% confidence interval, which goes from 0.16 to 0.53. This is derived from the difference between the manual transmission group and the mean of the automatic transmission group, which is 0.34. And remember, this is on the log scale. If we look at that range between the confidence interval, we see that the median of that is in fact 0 0.34. This is what we would expect to happen in the middle of that distribution. Again, remember this is the effect size on a log scale. Now we'll talk about analysis of variance, or as it's very commonly known, ANOVA. We're going to apply it to the same question as we just did with the t-test. You might think, why would we use this more complicated statistical test with uh, more of an output, more to interpret versus a t-test? But as we move forward, you'll see that ANOVA is really 
very powerful and will be used in many more circumstances than the t-test. I don't think I've ever published a t-test, even basic group means comparisons. Most people are doing with ANOVA because this basic model structure is very powerful and it can be expanded to fit all sorts of data types and conditions such as when our data don't necessarily need the underlying assumptions we can build on that ANOVA model to give us more robust models than we can ever get with the t-test which is pretty fixed at uh, just making group means comparisons. We just want to note right now that even though we're going from t-test to ANOVA and then we talk about linear regression later, ANOVA is essentially linear regression. It's really just a special case of the linear regression model. Uh, if that's not familiar to you or you're confused by that, there is a blog post on the class website uh, where we work through that and you can actually see how all those parts of a line can be derived when we're comparing two means. And so as such, we use the linear model function LM when we're conducting ANOVA in R. When it comes to doing statistics in R, LM really is our workhorse function. Now the thing technically stands for linear model, but we might as well think about it as being little, but mighty. Anyway, it's the workhorse function for almost any of our statistical analyses, whether they're linear regression or analysis variance, which again, are about the same thing. To fit an LM object, we start with a call to the LM function, and then we're using formula notation within that. So we'll have y as our dependent variable, set against x as our independent variable, and we identify the data frame. If x is categorical, we're doing an ANOVA. If x is continuous, we're doing a linear regression. We don't tell it which one we're doing, it's just the same thing, just depends on the nature of this x variable. When we fit that, we store it as an object. And then to use that, we have several functions that we can call to query it. We can use coef, which is a coefficient that just returns the beta coefficients for model term. We can call summary on that and get not only the beta coefficients, but we'd also get t values and p values as a significant test of those betas. Also, we get the R squared value, which is a goodness of fit and uh, quantifies the percentage of variance explained by the model. We'll also get an F value and degrees of freedom associated with that F value and a P value for those as an F test on the model. Now, summary is in its own right sort of an object itself. If you call this coefficients element of it, you'll get just the beta coefficients, the t-test, and the p-values on that. The third function we can call is a function called ANOVA, which will result in an ANOVA table with an f-test on that and associated p-values. We will fit our ANOVA by putting the log of MPG against the transmission type using formula notation in the lm function which we save as an object called tr underscore lm simply calling the object will return the model that we fit and the coefficients from the model now we can see two familiar values in the coefficients let's look back at the mean of the manual transmission group which is 3.163 and the difference between the manual and automatic transmission groups, which was 0.346. Now calling for the coefficient specifically from this model, we see the intercept is the same as the mean of the manual transmission group, 3.16, and the coefficient for the automatic transmission term is negative 0.346, which is the inverse of the 0.346 we got when we subtracted manual minus automatic. This is to be interpreted as the change in fuel economy as one goes from the manual to the automatic group means. 3.16 minus 0.34 would return the mean of the 
automatic transmission group or 2.817. To see both the t-test and the f-test, we run the summary function on the lm object. Let's take a minute to review the output of calling summary on the lm function. The first thing we want to focus on are the coefficients. We should recognize the mean of the manual transmissions as the intercept term, this 3.16. For the automatic transmissions, if we were to subtract this 3.14 from the mean manual estimate, we would get 2.816, which is the mean of the automatic transmission groups. So it is this difference here that is really the meat and potatoes of this result. This is the beta or slope coefficient of our model term. If you recall from the formula for the Calculating this, there is always error associated with the slope estimate. The ratio of those two is essentially linear regression, which gives us our t statistic. So in this case, we can take negative 0.35 and divide it by 0 0.09 to get a t statistic, which we can see here is negative 3.9. This negative t statistic carries the negative sign of the slope estimate showing a decline in the miles per gallon that is statistically significantly different and well below 0 0.05 and even below 0 0.001. Next thing we call attention to is the R squared value, this 0.337, which can be interpreted as 34% of the variation in the relationship between miles per gallon and the transmission type can be explained by this model. I recommend using the multiple R squared value and dismissing the adjusted R squared value if you're going to report one of these. The final line on this summary is the F test we see that the F statistic and the T statistic are quite different because they are arrived at in very different ways. And then we see that the P values, however, are identical, showing the same statistical relationship of the difference. And for the ANOVA table associated with the F test, we can call the function ANOVA on the LM object. Now we'll go over the ANOVA table that is produced by the ANOVA function. The main thing here is the ratio here in the mean sums of squares. Recall ANOVA is taking the term sum mean squares divided by the residuals to produce our F statistic. In this case, we have 0.927 for the transmission term divided by the residuals 0.061 to give us an F value of 15.2, excuse the rounding error here, which gives us that same P value that we got out of the F test and the T test and from summary. Let's review this ratio and how we get these particular numbers for the mean squared error. The mean squared error is a function of the summed squared error once it is divided by the degrees of freedom. So in other words, we can set mean sums of squares equal to the summed squared error divided by the degrees of freedom for each term. When we focus on the transmission term that we're interested in testing, we have 0.93 divided by 1 doesn't change that value, so our mean squared error is 0.93. In the residual error, however, we take our sum squared error, 0.182, and divide it by 30, the residual degrees of freedom, which substantially dilutes that value to give us a very low mean squared error. A low denominator here gives us a high F value when we compare the mean squared error. This really illustrates the importance of sample size. In this case, we have a total N of 32. And since degrees of freedom equals N minus 1, 
Our total degrees of freedom for this model is 31. And we can see that by adding up the degrees of freedom for the term and the residuals, 30 plus 1 is 31. But what if we had a case where our total n was only 16? We had a smaller sample size. Degrees of freedom in this case is 15. The transmission term is still going to take 1 degrees of freedom, leaving 14 for the residuals. If we divide 1.8 divided by 14 instead of 30, we get a much higher value of 0.13. That's our mean squared error that will divide out from the mean squared error of the term to give us an F statistic of 7.13, where it used to be in the previous model 15.3. We've cut it pretty much in half. Our p-value, though, goes down to 0 0.018 when it used to be 0 0.00049. Now we're still below 0 0.05, but you can see that we've reduced our p-value by orders of magnitude, and if we were marginal, this could have a big effect. Note how the F statistic returned at the bottom of the call to summary is 15.28 is the same as the F value given in the ANOVA results, 15.28, and the p-values are identical as well. Let's look at a box plot of a factor variable with more than two levels. Here we see evidence in the data that fuel economy declines as the number of cylinders increases. However, we might have questions about whether this is a general trend that applies to every increase, or rather simply that only eight cylinder engines have a different fuel economy than four cylinder engines. The analyses we've done so far, or specifically interpretations of the analyses we, done, we have done so far, are inadequate to analyze data with more than two levels in the categorical variable. We'll still use the ANOVA framework using the LM function, but we need to expand that and take an additional step and make what are called post hoc pairwise comparisons. Now one approach to these data might be that you could run a t-test on each comparison, a t-test of the four-cylinder versus the six-cylinder engines, a t-test comparing the four-cylinder and eight-cylinder engines, and then a third t-test in which we compare the six-cylinder engines to the eight-cylinder engines. Now this is uh, very frowned upon. This is not a good way to proceed. Um, what we're doing is we're violating some assumptions of independence and in that each of those p-values, if we couldn't be held to the same standard of 0 0.05 because we've conducted three tests. We've increased the probability that we might be able to get a result that is due to chance and not due to patterns in the data. So we would have to penalize each of those p-values so that they're more conservative if we're going to do a number of them. It's also just awkward to run a bunch of tests and try to report all of those statistics. And thirdly, we would be losing degrees of freedom because if we're only comparing subsets of our data, we lose the overall sample size, which is actually retained when we conduct a global ANOVA model and move forward with what are called post hoc pairwise comparisons. We test this statistically again by fitting an LM model. which we can evaluate with the ANOVA function. Let's review the ANOVA table produced for the factor with multiple levels. We have a very high F value and a very low P value, which on the face of it might look like a very good test statistic result, but we see that there's only one term for cylinders. If we focus on this, we can see that the degrees of freedom for the cylinder term has actually increased to two. This is derived from the fact that we have three levels of the cylinder term take away one and it gives us our two degrees of freedom, which should be an indication that there's something amiss with this model to have two degrees of freedom on a single line. So we're 
thinking about this F statistic as only applying to the cylinder term in general, which is to be interpreted as at least one level of the cylinder term is different than at least one other level. They might all be different, but we need another statistical test to confirm the pairwise comparisons. And we can also review the results of summary on this new LM object. Let's go over the results produced by calling summary on an object with multiple factor levels. We can start by looking at the at results of the F test. We see a high F statistic and a very low P value consistent with calling ANOVA. And in the coefficients, we see three again as we might expect with three levels, the first is the four cylinder mean fuel economy. We see that 3.27, which corresponds to our fuel economy box plot. Uh, we need to think about that on a log scale. And we can see here the mean of the four cylinder engines at 3.28. We have the mean of six cylinder engines down at 2.98. This difference of 0.3 miles per gallon on the log scale corresponds to this second beta coefficient, the six compared to four and the negative, so a decrease of 0.29, and we have a significant p value. We also have this eight cylinder mean of 2.7 on the log scale, which when compared against the four cylinder mean has a reduction of 0.57 miles per gallon on the log scale. This 0.57 corresponds to the beta coefficient for the comparison of eight cylinder engines against four cylinder engines, and we see that it also has a significant p-value. But what about this comparison between six cylinder engines and eight cylinder engines? We have a difference here that is unknown in terms of the products of our model. We don't have this eight cylinder to six cylinder comparison in the coefficients. We know that it is 0.28 just arithmetically, but again, we don't see it in the results of our statistical model. So we need something that will compare four cylinder models against the six cylinder models. We also need a model that will compare four cylinder cars against eight cylinder cars. We have both of these of course, but we need the six cylinder comparison against the eight cylinder comparison. Doing this is called a Tukey's post hoc comparison. To conduct our post hoc pairwise comparisons, we first convert the LM object to an AOV object with the AOV function and move that into the Tukey HSD function. Let's walk through now the results produced by calling Tukey HSD on the ANOVA object, where we're comparing here multiple comparisons of means with a focus on the cylinder term of the model. Familiar to us should be the six to four comparison with a 0.29 reduction in log fuel economy from the summary results. We also have this familiar 0.57 reduction on the log scale when we compare eight cylinder cars to four cylinder cars. New to us from the call to summary is this comparison of eight cylinder cars to six cylinder cars, which we calculated before as a reduction of 0.28. We'll review all the pieces of this output. We've already seen all these differences, the change in each of these comparisons. For those differences, we also get 95% confidence intervals and we see that none of them overlap zero, which would suggest that all of them are significant, which is cons confirmed by the p-values in this column here, a p-value for each of the comparisons. Now these are adjusted p-values, which means that there has been a 
conservative application of p-value calculation to account for the fact that we're making multiple comparisons in a single model, which is more robust than a series of pairwise comparisons. So that's a whirlwind tour of how we test continuous variables against categorical variables using base functions in R. In the next section, we'll go over the testing of continuous variables against continuous variables and continuous variables along with additional variables in linear and multiple regression. This lesson was brought to you by Base Functions T-Test, LM, and Summary, COEF, ANOVA, AOV, and Tukey HSD. And as always, this lesson was brought to you by the letter R.